Hi, welcome to Eye Openers. I'm your host, Brittany Drozd, and each week I bring you insightful conversations with entrepreneurs that will help you make more money, become a strong leader, and build a business culture that you're proud of. Grab your coffee and let's dive in. Hello and welcome to Eye Openers. If you have not had your coffee yet, I welcome you to join us, join Cameron and I as we kick off a Monday with a really fun conversation around workplace culture and with some eye-opening insights about how to live your life and run your business in a way that is much more fulfilling and ultimately gives you a greater return. But we don't do this alone. We do it with something to help inspire those eye-opening moments, which for me is my deep love of caffeine and coffee. <laughs> and Today, I am drinking my friend's coffee, um, not like her actual cup, but I mean, my friend Erin, who has an amazing coffee shop in town, uh, Handlebar Coffee Roasters in Santa Barbara. And the guy is just the nice guy. He donates coffee every Friday for parents in, at the school. And uh, I would definitely appreciate that. Uh, but he's just like that person you want to say hi to in the morning and just a really great entrepreneur. He's in there leading his team every day, even though he doesn't have to. So I really commend him for that and love supporting him in that way. Um, how about you, Cameron? What is your coffee of choice or your eye opener of choice this morning? Well, this morning I am drinking, you know, being a Seattle girl, I am <laughs> drinking Starbucks. Uh, but I may, I did make it at home. Um, it's Pike Place Roast, notes of cocoa and Ridge Praline. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I'm a big coffee girl myself, and I love that this is eye openers, and that that your love of caffeine like trumps all else. I mean, that sounds fantastic. Well, no, people might not know this, but I also grew up in Washington State, and so I feel like there is this real culture around coffee, mostly because of Starbucks. But you know, pizza's up there. There's lots of coffee culture in the Pacific Northwest, and I think that I saw that early on, like even in high school, meeting my friends like at a Starbucks and hanging out. And I just enjoyed it as a meeting place. I spent endless hours studying at a Starbucks and preferred it to the library just because I think because of the humans and like the connection and the warmth of that environment. And so I think because of that, it is just deeply rooted in my process, a part of my work, a part of my learning and here part of this podcast. So Thank you guys all for being part of it with us. Oh, we have some friends on here saying they also have their coffee and love their caffeine. Thank you, Courtney. Thank you, Crystal. Good to have you guys with us. Um, so let's tell everybody why they should even be paying attention today and um, hear a bit from our special guest, Miss Cameron. So Cameron is an executive leadership and personal development coach. She focuses on helping women in their 50s make extraordinary change. She was born in Seattle, but now resides in Providence, Rhode Island with her husband, daughter, cat, and new puppy, who I have been lucky enough to get the chance to meet, and puppy is so adorable. She lived in China, Vietnam, Germany, and New York City in the beginning part of her career. Um, prior to becoming a coach, uh, she worked in consumer goods and international operations for brands like Adidas, Coach, and Brahmin. So you guys, when we talk about organizational culture today, we are talking about these like global enterprises, these, these known brands, these companies that you have heard of or you probably have in your house. And that's why Cameron's experience and what she's going to share with us, these eye-opening moments we're going to have today are so valuable. Now, not only does she do all that, but she's so passionate about helping women find their voice that she is the host of the podcast, 50 Not Dead. And that is about fighting against gendered ageism in the workplace. Cameron, why don't you kick off by just telling us a little bit about the podcast? Thank you so much. It is such a pleasure to be here with you, Brittany. I always love a chance to get to see you, of course, to have coffee. And the podcast is really, it's just a really special thing to me. It wasn't my dream to become a podcaster. I would never have guessed, actually, that I would be a podcast host. But as I was looking at turning 50, I guess last year, because I'll be 51 soon, I was feeling really good and feeling like I have so much to offer and so much to learn still. And like, you know, my business was doing well, and I, I have so many ideas for it. And then I started hearing things that were totally the 
like the converse of that, of just like, um, oh, well, that's when you become most invisible, you know, is nothing, nobody is more invisible than a 50 year old mother. I'm like, oh, well, great. That feels really good. Uh, and, and then talking to women who certainly the pandemic really, you know, like, I, I think brought to this to the forefront, but many women were laid off or furloughed or had to step out of the workplace because right. of the pandemic. So they had to step out to take care of elderly parents or children or both. Mm-hmm. And they were saying things to me like, I may never work again. I may have to take a huge pay cut. I haven't interviewed in 15 years. And I just thought, God, the pandemic didn't happen to women over 50. Like what is happening here? And it seemed to highlight and put an acceleration on this thing that I was just learning about because nobody tells you that all of a sudden you turn 50 and like a a new clock is ticking. I mean, like some clock seems to always be ticking for us. (laughs) It's like the, the podcast was a place initially for me to just give voice to this of I interview a different woman every week and we talk about her experience. You know, has she encountered extreme gendered ageism? And some of it is just like blatantly obvious and horrible. You know, it's like, oh, I turned 50. I had my 50th birthday party and then I was basically escorted out the door, which is illegal, but can be housed in things like, oh, department restructure or Mm -hmm. uh, something like that. But then also I didn't want it to turn into just a big bitch fast <laughs> because i knew that would get old for people really quick sure i sure also so. wanted to show well, y'all some. broken right like how many times do we have to hear it's broken but what yeah. else and, and have it be also some place for good stories too like some right. things that would inspire us and then to have some tough conversations sometimes so that is 50 not dead it has become like a real part of my life and a part of it's part of my business but more of the part that is um, really the people that I want to serve. Yeah, that's fantastic. That's what I appreciate about you, like not shying away from something that might be uncomfortable for people to talk about, but really giving space to it so that they can go to your podcast if they're having these challenges or to not feel like alone in that experience, I think is so important. Um, I know that you just even thinking about the Barbie movie, which might, mm-hmm. you know, hopefully to other people who are here listening that it just highlighted so many things we we knew deep down or but we just didn't like talk about collectively or or out loud with other people and and so hopefully this creates like a same experience yeah but uh, so oh and crystal saying that she has feeling unseen this seems to be this seems uh to not be where we need to be women of all ages should be visible in um in ranges of knowledge right so Really, you should be at that peak, right? Because you have so much experience and it's not being recognized or seen that way. So that, you know, your podcast and what you're doing there really does bring us to why I wanted to have you on. People might not know, but I had the privilege of being with Karen early on and launching into your coaching career. And you have so much amazing experience in in businesses, in these, you know, really best businesses in the world. but they are not, they don't come without other challenges and they definitely are not perfect examples of workplace culture. And I know so much of the reason why you started your coaching business is what you had experienced and some of the negative impacts of being in these more toxic workplaces. And while I love to focus on the positive too, and we're going to totally pull out positive components of this, I do think it's really important to acknowledge where we're starting. And a lot of places are in a low starting point and a lot of people are having really negative experiences in their workplace. And if for nothing else, I just want to highlight that you are not alone in that. And a lot of people work for these big global brands and have these terrible experiences. But if this can be, you know, if we can give you a few ideas on how to either move within that landscape or get out of it or challenge it in a way that works for you, then um, I would say mission accomplished today. Cameron, would you mind sharing a either your own experience? And I don't mind, you know, you don't have to share any confidential information, but what was something that happened in your workplace experience that really ultimately led you to wanting to become an executive coach and help people who are facing challenges. Oh, thank you, Brittany. So 
you know, it was really interesting. I had been seeing some behavior and I think that I'd worked in fashion for a long time and working in the athletic industry. I mean, these places are known to be competitive environments, right? I'm, I mean, it's like it's fast paced. It's in the athletic industry. There's a lot of bro culture there in the fashion industry. There's a diva culture at times. And so you go into it kind of knowing some of that. But what really turned for me was, I mean, I loved it. I mean, I love not what I just described, right? Diva and bro stuff. But, but I mean, I really loved my jobs that I'd had. And I felt like there were, I mean, it gave me tremendous opportunity. But when I was the target and really was in something that I would consider toxic, um, all of a sudden I started having this feeling of being on edge all the time knowing that I was going to be quizzed in front of large groups of people, called out for facts that, I mean, I ran an entire, you know, I ran, I ran all of operations for a global organization. There's a lot of detail, um, but I would be quizzed in front of people for it all the time. And so, and, and all of a sudden, like, no matter what I did, it was never right. So no matter how hard I tried, it was never okay. And I'd seen other women be targeted in one of these particular organizations. And I was just like, oh, my God, this is horrible. Like, why would we allow for this? And it is a very interesting thing. And you might say, well, Cameron, why don't you just speak up for God's sake? Like, why don't you do something about it? Right. And, you know, in hindsight, I should have. I knew something was odd. And I knew and I told myself, um, wow, when it's my turn, I'm out of here. But I'd been out of the workforce for three years. And when I had a baby, I stayed out for three years and it was wonderful. I'm so lucky to have had that time. And so I was hesitant to speak up and say, I don't think this is right. Like, I don't think we should be humiliating people in front of their peers. That doesn't seem like a positive experience because then people are afraid to talk. And I saw this happening where people would be like really torn down publicly. And, you know, I wasn't. It didn't take long before I saw somebody leave, you know, had to be going go to the hospital because they were such a mess from having to struggle with this. And I didn't quite know what was going on, except I told myself when it was my turn, I'd leave. But when it was my turn, it is really insidious. And it really got under my skin where I could no longer discern this has happened to you know, I've seen it happen to, you know, this woman and this woman and this woman and this woman. All of a sudden it was me. And it was like, holy crap, maybe I really am stupid. Maybe I am worthless. Maybe my years of experience are outdated. And I asked if I could, if they would support me with a coach. And I was laughed at and said that only the greenest of managers would be supported with a coach. And I was like, an executive coach? And it, so they wouldn't support it. And I was asking the CEO and head of HR and, um, and they said no. And, I, and I, I was just really honest. I was just like, just nothing is working. And that really led me to ultimately want to help other women who are in my situation. Like, because I didn't know where to turn. Like, if your company doesn't support you, where do you go? And right. then it just gets under your skin. And like, oh, is it just me? Do I just try harder? Right. Well, that's such an interesting point that, you know, people, I think people believe like, well, if I recognize that this was happening to me, I would do something about it or I'd speak up. And this is so similar to like, if you face domestic abuse or even psychological abuse in a partnership or something where you turn on yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing that nobody anticipates is the way that these abuses or just bullying toxic environments take place is it starts to make you question you. And that's what's so dangerous about it. But by the time we can recognize that we've already gone down this path of thinking, I'm not enough, or maybe you've burned yourself out trying to be enough and realizing it's never going to be enough. You know, there's yeah. so many things that we try to do to fix it because the, the feeling is so uncomfortable, especially when you're a high performer and you've been recognized as a high performer um, for most of your career. It can be so confusing. And that being in that mental space is what is so challenging. Yes, absolutely. And you nailed it when you said it's like psychological manipulation. I mean, that's where, and I didn't understand that. I remember 
telling another colleague, I'm like, oh my God, you have to leave. <laughs> Get out of here. You're being treated so horribly. And she said, I can't quit. And I remember asking, but well, it's not about quitting. I mean, it's about like saving your dignity and saving your soul. And I just didn't get it. And I, and I didn't know what her financial situation was. I'm like, well, like, it's my business. Um, and I really, really loved working with this person, but I just thought this is dangerous. And then when it was my turn, I couldn't quit because I was bound and determined to figure out what but to, to like make it right, to like turn the, you know, turn the, flip the switch and like, like, no, I'm not, I'm not useless. I'm like, I'm, I'm an idiot. I'm like, why like, I hate me. Like, you know, and it, 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 yeah. And all of a sudden it, and it just, you know, as you said, you, once you go through that door, if you don't notice it right away, it's a really slippery slope. And I stayed, I would say I stayed 18 months too long to the point where I was in, near personal complete destruction and it was it was not it wasn't good it was so unhealthy so what kind of things did you notice start to happen like maybe in your body for yourself like your mental health what did you notice um as it was starting to get pretty bad so as somebody who was responsible for all kinds of things and was now quizzed on these things i couldn't remember anything at all it was such a nightmare and I had worked, I mean, at other big, big companies where I had to know, you know, prices of, you know, leathers and handbags and buckles and all these different things for, you know, from five years ago. And I mean, and, and we had to know that stuff, but we weren't. And it was it was nitpicky and niggly, but it wasn't being called out publicly. And I couldn't remember anything. And so I, that was not great. And then the you know, if people asked me outside of work, how are you doing? I would just get this like lump in my throat. You know, it was like, I could hardly speak about it without wanting to burst into tears. And it was terrible because I wasn't in a place where I was actively looking to leave. I, I really wanted to make it work still, but it was like my voice, like the voice inside of me had been crushed so badly. And I think that's where it was really like literally stuck in my throat. Oh, and that was all. And then afterwards, when I did leave, then it got um, physically even worse. It was like then because it was like my body was so used to being on, under that pressure that then I experienced panic attacks for the first time. And I had anxiety before where, you know, sometimes you wake up and there's like, feels like there's a weight on your chest and you're like, oh, I can't breathe. And you, you, you maybe think you're having a heart attack and it's really scary. But in, in some time, and not to say that anxiety attacks aren't terrifying because they really can be. But I had anxiety, but I hadn't had panic and I didn't know the difference. And um, panic is even more physical where all of a sudden, I felt like I was going to shatter into a million pieces. Well, it's much more acute. It feels like an 11 out of 10. Like, yes, it, mm -hmm. it was terrifying. So I can't, I have, can I take care of my daughter? Can I drive and take care of my daughter? Can I do anything? And that was absolutely terrifying. And that was when I, I mean, I, I got a lot of help. Right, right. So what you're describing, it makes so much sense and is so consistent actually with symptoms we see in PTSD. So I don't often put my clinical hat on, but I think it's really important to illustrate that though in this, in the nature of this work. Like I think people minimize it when they're in a toxic work environment. Like if I share with people, if I'm at a dinner party and I share what I do or someone asks, oh my gosh, I need you to come. Like you need to come talk to my boss about this or whatever. It's so bad. And it's, it's fine to flippantly say that, but I think there needs to be space to really recognize if you are in that because it can be so damaging to you personally. And that symptom that you described of forgetfulness is classic where if we are so flooded with cortisol and our adrenals are firing because we are in fight or flight all the time, or especially when we're at the workplace, then our executive functioning gets worse. And irony is like a lot of bosses are, or people use this tactic to try to like bully you into being more productive or better or, you know, keep you on your toes, they think. To, oh my God. Oh my God. As you're saying that, I'm going to say, oh my God, some of this stuff is yeah. like words that they would use, you know? 
I mean, yeah, I it was thought to be a positive. But the irony is it makes people perform worse. And I feel like if people, if people just understand, I really feel like there are some bullies out there who think they're doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. I think they really do want the best for their people and their business, and they think this is the right way. Uh, and then there's some people who are real jerks, and we can talk about that too. But yeah, same people who are like kind of on the fence, you're like kind of a good person. Uh, this do not do this because not only are you impairing the functionality of your people, you are going to lose productivity and ultimately ROI. Like on on your team, they're going to be lower performers. So for just the business case alone, like never mind the fact that you should just be a good human in treatment. The data supports that this is the worst thing you could do for your business. Yeah, I absolutely agree, Brittany. And it was very interesting because it was a revolving door. And I remember being also just thinking like, why aren't we talking about this? Like, why aren't we talking about the fact that so many people come in and then they leave, they come in and then they leave. And like, I had never been at a senior level where that kind of thing, if it were happening, wasn't like, okay, we are having a conversation about this. What right. is happening? Because it's expensive. It's yes. really expensive. Not And to your point, the loss of productivity for the ones that stay and the potential health uh, impact. But also, unless you are a recruiter, I don't think you want your HR department to be full-time recruiters, you know, and like just like constantly, 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 because any of us who have held, held jobs where we depend on other people to do good work, my gosh, it takes a long time to get somebody trained and acclimated and learn all the systems and all of the language that you use that's specific to your industry. And to just watch that walk out the door over and over and over again, it, I, yeah. I, I mean, I cannot imagine that anybody would say, hmm, this seems like a really good business idea. Right. Some of the research suggests that a loss leader is the loss in productivity and all that it adds up to 150% of their annual salary. Right. So we think about what executives are being paid or any top talent, mm -hmm. anybody, it, when you lose someone, it's essentially like losing 150% of that person's um, salary and loss productivity and the training time and the recruiting, you know, payout, like all of that. So it really behooves people to pay attention to how we are leading. How are we taking care of our people? How are we showing that we're invested and supportive? Because creating a, a more positive culture for the workplace, I make this business case all the time, but it should be about the people. It should be about wanting to create a good work experience and create a place for people to come together to create something bigger than themselves. But beyond that, I always tie in the business case because sometimes at the end of the day, it's about money. And yeah. you think that's about money for you. It still supports that this is the direction we should move in. Oh, okay. You see my friend, Matt, who is also a uh, Washingtonian. Tough economic climate, unfortunately, do bring out the worst in people. You are so right, Matt talking to many people with the toxic leader or company thinking they can fix it or that it's somehow fault or problem. Life is too short. I couldn't agree more. And you guys, if you want a great example of what to do to build a positive work environment, Matt is amazing. His company, Heinz Marketing, is incredible. And the way he takes care of his people is very inspirational. So Cameron, what do you wish so someone had done in that moment? Either... You know, I'm thinking more about the other people who either witness this happening or or even your boss. Like, how do you wish they had um, confronted you if there was challenges or better developed you versus this kind of toxic bullying that you experienced? Oh, you know, it's it's so interesting. So I, I wanted to make a quick point that, you know, you had said something, Brittany, about that some people feel like it's the right thing to do. And I had also worked. I had worked in Asia before standards of engagement had really been rolled out in the um, uh, athletic and fashion big manufacturing where where people were accused of sweatshops and where we worked like dogs. <laughs> we worked really hard. I mean, this was the 90s, late 90s. And we, you know, I worked 16 hour days. I worked, I went to work with worms. You know, that's really pleasant. I work, I went to work with some kind of Asian measles or mumps, I think, and some kind of form of Asian mumps. I worked through it. I remember leaving the office at three, going home, showering, coming back, working, getting on a flight, working the flight, getting off, getting off in Europe, going and presenting. I mean, like I had worked under 
incredibly pretty, I would say, tough um, expectations, very, very, very high expectations. But the difference was that it was recognized and I was thanked. And I was, and, and it was so interesting because even though it wasn't necessarily always pleasant, right, to work like crazy like that, um, I was, I mean, I write about the, the boss I had then all the time because I learned so much and I knew that he was, I mean, he took time out to grow me, to have conversations, to teach me things. And so even though I was working like a complete dog and passed out at work one day and slept in God knows how long and I was you know, sick as a dog and I mean, just with all this stuff, it was still, I hold it as a huge opportunity versus this other situation where it was, I was working hard, but I was being torn apart. It was like being, I like shredded, like a piece of paper that literally was just being shredded. How much could they take away each day? And what I wish if, if I could turn the clocks back, what would have been so helpful is if the CEO had just gotten curious, like, well, you know what? We brought you in and we really, you know, I mean, I think they had really high, I don't think that we started out thinking we are going to hate each other by the time this ends. Right. I mean, if she had asked like, you know, what's, what's going on or like, where do you need support or is there, is there something that I'm missing? Right. Mm -hmm. Or any kind of curiosity or personal development that was embraced within the company because it wasn't, there was no personal development. And in fact, there, there were just, and I remember really missing that of just like, um, I was really lucky to start my career at a time where certainly big companies were really embracing a lot of personal development. I was so lucky to have all of this leadership training paid for by the companies I worked for. And when I look back at that time, Again, I think just engaging in a human conversation of like, well, you have all this experience, like what's going on? Because I'm really disappointed and now I hate your fucking guts. When can we talk about like, where'd you go off the rails? You know, and because I didn't know that I had potentially gone off the rails, you know, and time does help in terms of, and a lot of therapy and frankly, a lot of training at the coach and I can look at that experience now and see my part, where my part did lie, at least from, you know, again, from, from my side. It wasn't right. perfect. Right. And there were things where we could have had conversation and where, again, just maturity and, you know, a few more years under my belt where I'm like, okay, and I coach people on that now. Like, mm -hmm. you know, make sure you keep the people above you up to speed with what you're doing. You know, don't assume that even though you think it is absolutely right, that they think so too. Um, but the, frankly, the, the biggest thing that would have changed at all would just have been some real conversation around it before it turned so bad where, you know, I asked another really highly, uh, it was one of the owners, you know, and I just said, you know, do you know how bad it feels to walk by somebody who just hates your guts and who doesn't care if you drop dead? And he had no answer. And it was just so painful because it was so clear he knew. And it was not going to be stopped. Well, that is so tough, right? But when you're in that place, it's kind of like your decision to make, right? Like, okay, this is what they're tolerating. This is what they're okay with for their business. Yes. Am I going to continue to be a part of that? Exactly. And that's where as a coach, and I think, you know, as the individual. And I think somebody in your comments had said, you know, you know, when, when times are tough, right. People can act. We all know when, when times are tough, belts get tighter and things get more scrutinized. People get more scrutinized, but we have to always too. And one of the things I ask people is, is it just, you know, have, you know, really help them discern. Is it the company? Have you seen this? Is this a pattern? Uh, or is this really just happening to you? And have you experienced this kind of reaction with other people? You know, it's important to know, like, we all have blind spots. Like, we're not perfect. And there might be some, there definitely, like I said, I can look at it, my own behavior, my own performance now much easier and say, I could have done better in some areas. Could I have fixed that situation? Oh, my God, not in a million years. Right. We can wait. 
So you pulled out some key things I want to tie into like what we're seeing in workplaces right now. You mentioned recognition. People don't realize how far that goes. And I say it all the time, like, do you want to boost your employee engagement with something that's free? Because everybody thinks they need to give bonuses and raises and promotions. And that's not always available, especially when times are tough. Giving positive feedback and recognition is free and it'll be the most valuable thing you do. And in fact, they reckon they suggest doing a five to one ratio. So five positive um, pieces of feedback to each critical piece of feedback. So think about that. if you do need to be driving and in, in giving critical feedback, make sure you are giving that positive feedback in that five to one ratio. That will really motivate people to want to be better because they love getting that positive feedback from you. So you really train people to want to pursue that and work harder to to receive that. So ultimately that will work in your favor. But really that's free. Please do that. And then you said opportunities to train, to be developed, to grow. That is the leading reason why top performers are attracted to an organization, an opportunity that maybe they're applying for, and why they stay at organizations. That's everything to do with those growth opportunities. And I'm not just talking about promotions. I'm talking about, can you help develop me into a stronger employee, like technical skills, leadership skills? A lot of companies are paying for coaching. You know, all of these things really, really lead to happier employees, more engaged employees in a ultimately a stronger bottom line. Um, Chris mm-hmm. did it earlier and said that she wishes there was a way to support the conversation about a toxic work environment internally. And I would just say to that, if you guys aren't talking about culture as an organization, you're going to be forced to talk about culture eventually. And it it's no fun to do it when everything has gone south. A turnaround is so hard. It requires so much time, so much financial investment. If if you're a business owner, if you're a leader watching this, I can't stress enough how important it is that culture should be a regular part of your conversation. It, you know, the famous words of Peter Drucker, right? Like culture eats strategy for breakfast. You can have... Yeah. I see companies do this all the time. Though. Think about how many strategic meetings you've been in, corporate strategy, planning sessions, right? People invest so much money in this. If they don't invest in their culture. And that is one of the biggest mistakes that we see people make. Yeah, I, you know, Brittany, I have written several times that leadership goes so much further than the desk. And what I mean by that is, you know, if you are cracking the whip at work, so to speak, and always just, if you're terrible to your people, if you're not kind, right, it just, it's not that these people at the end of the day are just like, oh, okay, oh, I'm just leaving work. I'm fine now. They take it home with them. Then they don't have the energy for their kids. They don't have energy for their workout. They don't have energy for their partner. And the, the opposite is true too. Like if you are a leader, even if it's to say, you know, you needed your team to work really hard and do something. It's just like, hey, you know what? I saw that thing come through at 1130 last night. I really appreciate it. I know it was late. I know that's why you're tired today, but thank you. Right. I mean, like that, they take that too. And then it's just like, oh yeah, well, no problem. You know, I, you know, I don't, I don't mind because generally I think everybody really wants to do a good job. And to your point earlier, and it's not just praise for praise's point, but it's just that recognition. I think one of the most terrible feelings we can have as humans is to not be seen, right? I mean, we want to be seen and to not be seen or to feel like we are only seen as you know, for the our flaws, it is just so damaging. And you can, you know, if you're a leader, your impact goes so far. It goes so much further than you might be aware of. You are reaching into people's hearts and homes and into their families so whether you're really good or really bad, you know, it's it's time to take stock and be a real good one. <laughs> you know, it's like because you can impact, you know, you can be doing things philanthropically that you don't even know by recognizing that somebody's working really hard for you, you know, and then, of course, if you can give them a raise, great, but it's you're going to motivate them 
as much or more by letting them know that you see what they're doing and that their contributions matter to you. Great. Really important stuff. Cameron, thank you so much for being here. I know I learned a lot from just hearing your experience and how people could do things differently. I know we had a lot of participation. Thank you guys from the audience for being here and submitting great feedback and questions along the way. Cameron, how could people reach out to you if they want to learn more about your work or hear about your podcast? Oh, thank you. They, I mean, it's very easy to find me on LinkedIn. I'm also on I mean, LinkedIn is the the easiest way or the podcast 50 Not Dead is on every major platform. And if you have a story that you'd like to share about gendered ageism or want to have a discussion about it, by all means, please reach out. I'm I'm here for you. Thank awesome. you, Rick. Well, we will make sure that your LinkedIn information is on the show notes. If you are watching this live, you probably see her LinkedIn right there. We just love having you on and love the experience and the gift you're bringing to the world by creating a place for people to land that have had struggles but are looking to kind of overcome them. So thank you again for sharing your eye-opening moments with us. And thank you to the audience for being here and all of your participation. Until next time, guys, create an amazing work and personal life that you're proud of, that feels fulfilling for you because ultimately that's the most important thing we can do. Thank you. Thanks for joining us this week on Eye Openers. Make sure to visit brittanydroz.com slash podcast for this week's show notes. And if you found value in today's episode, I would so appreciate you giving us a rating on Apple Podcasts or share it with a friend. Also, don't forget to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. This all helps to support the show.